Christ Church. I want to welcome you today, this uh, beautiful day. We're excited about worshiping together. We're excited about you being with us, coming off, um, you know, a great Resurrection Sunday last week. And uh, we're going to be uh, looking at something a little bit interesting today. For those of you who may, may or may not know, you've been paying attention to the news. Tomorrow we have a special event. Anybody know what it is? Yep. Got a, a, a total solar eclipse through much of the um, part of the uh, you know continental United States. It's definitely is going to be affecting our area here tomorrow if we get a sunny day. And so it's going to be pretty cool and pretty interesting. So we're going to kind of think about those things, getting our eyes lifted up to the heavens. That's really what I want us to be uh, uh, contemplating uh, today as we look at, uh, as, we, as we move into tomorrow and the uh, solar eclipse. So if you would, let's stand together and we're going to worship. <clears throat>
this with me. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. guys can go say it. Amen. I'm going to ask Miss Lynn to come share a welcome and prayer. Good morning. Good to be here today, isn't it? Beautiful day the Lord has made. Um, just going to do a few quick announcements. As always, please check your bulletins because there's a lot of information on there. However, there's a few inaccurate things on there, so we're going to go over a few things today. Um, first of all, if you are visiting for the first time, we're so glad that you're here and we welcome you and we're just blessed that you chose to visit with us today. And we do ask that you grab one of those cards that you'll find in the seat back in front of you and, and just fill it out so we can get a little information about you. Um, so a couple things. Um, first of all, Wednesday dinners. We have a nice menu um, laid out for the month of April, but... For now, as you all know, we had a, a fire in the kitchen um, a couple weeks ago, or well, a week ago Wednesday. So <laughs> for now, there are, are all of our Wednesday night dinners are, are postponed, and we will let you know as soon as we're back up and running. But for right now, there's uh, no Wednesday night dinner, so you can just <laughs> dream about chicken tenders for <laughs> the next week, I guess. Um, uh, also, um, the Lady Spring Tea is Saturday, April 26th. The time is 1130. So just make that note. Your bulletin says 11. It starts at 1130. There's a sign-up sheet 
back out there in the lobby. Um, it's $15, and that is due on April 21st. So just make sure you sign up so, um, and you can pay your money up until April 21st. We just need to have a count so we have the right amount of food ready for that. Um, we have kids camp and the Branson trip coming up this summer. Just check those dates up. Both of those are online for sign up. Also be praying about whether or not you'd be willing to sponsor uh, um, a child. I know both myself and uh, Cameron ha have several kids that will need a little bit of help in order to attend camp this summer. So just take a look at that. Um, starting point class actually started today. So um, if you weren't there, you missed the first class, but you can probably make it up. So um, if you're interested in that, just see Marcus. And then last, just again, um, immediately following the service, Eternal Bread Ministry does go out. Uh, and uh, go out to Jackson Avenue and, and through the city of Memphis. And again, God is working um, just so tremendously. We use that, we use the kitchen a lot for eternal bread ministry and just having that um, not here, you know, God has just opened so many doors and is just providing so much in order for us to con continue that ministry. Um, the weather's getting nice, so if you haven't, if you haven't come out with us, um, be a good time to start coming out. Again, we leave um, just immediately uh, following this service. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the many opportunities that you do give us to be a part of your ministry here on earth. And so, Father, we just we just pray for each one of those ministries that um, our church um, facilitates. And we're thankful again to uh, be blessed with being able to participate in that. And we do pray for the people that we do minister to. Father, just open our eyes to see them as you do um, when we go out and and be with these people. Let us to see their hearts the way that you do. Help us to see them through your eyes. And Father, we thank you for the many, many blessings that we do partake of here on earth. And Father, we thank you so much more for the many blessings and awards awaiting us in heaven. So Father, I just ask that you please forgive us for getting stuck into thinking about all the things that it may seem that we lack right now. Instead of focusing on what we don't have right here on earth, Father, help us to reset our thoughts and begin focusing on things above. And Father, just help us to fix our eyes on you today. Please work in us and turn our attention toward you in all things. And Father, we put our hope, we put our confidence in you right now. Thank you, thank you to your faithfulness to us. It's your name we pray, amen. The women's spring tea is Saturday, April 27th. She said that. She said the 26th. But oh. there, there was a confusion with the dates last week. So 27th is a Saturday. <laughs> there was a, um, a, a phrase that was used in the early, um, in the early church. Uh, and it was, it was a, a phrase that you may or may not be familiar with. But it's, it's, a, it's a word called Maranatha. Maranatha, and that that phrase Maranatha it means even so, come, come Lord Jesus quickly, come, and uh, you know I think everybody here at times uh, living in this world, struggling through the difficulties of life, um, there there are probably many times throughout our life when we just say Lord. I'm just ready. I'm just ready for for you to come. Uh, you know, whether I go to be with you or, or you come back to to reclaim this world for for your for your glory and your kingdom. Uh, I think all of us can identify with with that feeling, and that's that's really what this next song is all about. So um, let's stand together as we sing this. Sometimes I fall to my knees and pray. Come, Jesus, come. 
Let today be a day And sometimes I feel Like I'm going to pray But I'm holding on To a hope that won't fade Sing this with me Come Jesus, come We've been waiting so long For the day you return To heal every hurt And right every wrong We need you right now We'll come and turn this around
Lord, I just ask people to, um, Lord, just to be open, open to hear from you, Lord Jesus, whatever that may sound like to them, Lord, and let them respond to that, to that voice that they're hearing. Lord, we love you, and we ask all these things in your son's name, amen. Amen. All right. Can y'all hear me out there okay? All right, guys, so if you would, let's open our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. 
Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. My message today is titled, Lift Up Your Head. So we're going to have some theological implications, some practical implications, using tomorrow's solar eclipse as an opportunity for all of us to examine ourselves, to get our eyes fixed back on Jesus, to get our eyes fixed off earthly things and putting them more on heavenly things, eternal things. And so uh, I hope today's message is going to be informative, encouraging to you. And so many of you, I'm sure, are aware that tomorrow we're going to have what's being called the Great Solar Eclipse in America, the Great American Solar Eclipse. Um, if you've been uh, paying attention to social media, uh, any news outlets, uh, it's, it's all over the place. And I want to address some of those things today as we look at this passage. But tomorrow afternoon, um, this solar eclipse will be passing um, basically from uh, Mexico into Texas, going all the way up through Arkansas, south of the boot hill of Missouri and Illinois, up into Ohio, and on out into the northeast Maine, and then on out into the Atlantic Ocean. And so um, it's going to have a, a path of totality. Anybody have heard, heard that recently, the path of totality? So the path of totality is the path in which there will be a full, complete, total blackening, darkening of the sun. And so if you're in this path of totality, I've never experienced this personally, but for several minutes, depending on where you are, up to two to four minutes, you will be, in, uh, you'll be able to witness in the middle of the day basically total darkness, even to the point to where you can see stars in the sky. It's going to be an amazing thing to behold. So as a result of this, because this is a very unique um, uh, phenomenon for North America... Um, there are people traveling. I know there are some people I know personally who are traveling today, and they're trying to go find a place within the path of totality, somewhere maybe in Arkansas or Missouri or Illinois or whatever it may be. And so they're wanting to go to be able to experience this firsthand because it really can be, it really kind of is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. So millions of people will be traveling today, tomorrow, and Tuesday, uh, which has caused many of our state governors to declare states of emergency because of just having to handle this influx of people. There's going to be people everywhere. They're going to be using up all the food and the gas and all the hotel rooms. And uh, it's, it's going to be a mess uh, in a lot of places. So a lot of places who are in the path of totality are the, the locals there trying to prepare for this massive influx of people who are coming from all over the country and perhaps even over all over the world to see this uh, solar eclipse. So there's a, there's a lot of chatter uh, out there. As I said, if you're on social media, I'm sure you've probably heard a lot of things, um, interesting things. And, and what's, what I, I kind of want to address today is that, unfortunately, uh, many in the pro prophetic community, okay, people who study biblical prophecy, uh, every time we have something like this happen, uh, they jump at the opportunity to, to start making all of these prophetic predictions, right? Oh, Jesus is coming back April 8th, you know, it's the, it's the solar eclipse, and it's the rapture, and we're all going to be out of here, and, you know, this is it. And then it comes and goes, and nothing happens, and they look like what? They look like fools. And the rest of the world, you know, in 1988, some guy wrote, you know, there's 88 reasons why the rapture is going to happen in 1988. And 1988 came, and it didn't happen. So he revised it to 90 things that are going to happen in 1990 for the reason of the rapture. And guess what? In 1990, it didn't happen. And so that guy looked like a fool. And the, from the outside world, you got people who are skeptical and people who are kind of, kind of looking at the church, looking at, at believers from an, from an outside view, looking in. And when they see things like that, they're like, man, these people are a bunch of loonies. Looney toonies. You know, conspiracy theorists. And that's why we should not try to predict dates and and, and all of those kind of things when it comes to the day and the hour of the Lord's return because we know that nobody knows the day or the hour, okay? So anybody that's trying to tell you Jesus is coming back on this day, run from that person. 
Okay? Because they're not biblical. They're not um, standing on the, the Word of God. So, so when it comes to these kind of things, you know, my, my job for, for you today is that what are we to make of something like this great solar eclipse? Because if you remember, and this is why this is, there's been a little bit more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Maybe more buzz, more enthusiasm about this particular eclipse is because in 2017, how many of you remember we had another solar eclipse? And that eclipse came from the northwest part of the, of, the, of the nation and down to the southeast part, and it did cross through Tennessee. And again, I'll give you an example. That was, that was in August of 2017. Well, guess how much time will have passed between that eclipse in 2017 and this eclipse that's going to happen tomorrow. You just wouldn't believe it. There's been six years, six months, and six days. You see what I'm saying? So all of a sudden, people are like, oh, we got it now, 666, this is it. Okay, I'm telling you, this is the kind of stuff that you got to kind of be careful about. And hey, is it interesting? Sure, it's, it's all, y'all know me, you know me long enough, I just right up my alley. But you got to be careful. How do you handle this stuff responsibly? What, what are we really to make of something like this solar eclipse? Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want to look at Luke chapter 21. We're going to read verses 25 through 28 this morning. And I hope when you walk away from this message today, you'll have a greater appreciation for what God is doing. You'll have a, a much more responsible interpretation about how do, we, how do we supposed to look at these kind of things when, when something like this happens. Because it is rare in the sense that here in the heartland of America, we, this does not happen very often. And I'll, I'll get into more of that a little bit later. So how are we supposed to uh, make of all, what are we supposed to make of all this? How are we supposed to interpret all of these things? So let's look at Luke 21 verse 25 this morning. And I'm going to read uh, three or four verses right here from the gospel of Luke, beginning in verse 25. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, and there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and of the waves. Look at what it says. Jesus is saying, people will be fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming upon the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, okay, when these things begin to take place, lift up, stand up, and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Stand up, lift up your heads because your redemption is is drawing near. So let's take this, this passage here that Jesus has given us from Luke chapter 21 and let's kind of see if we can make sense of what's happening tomorrow, April 8th, in this great American solar eclipse. First thing I want to share with you today is that God created the celestial bodies in the heavens, okay, to serve as signs and seasons. This is very important. God created the celestial bodies in the heavens. When I say celestial bodies, what am I talking about? Basically the sun, the moon, the stars, the constellations. All of these things, they do have a purpose. God built them with design. He built them with purpose. He built them with order. He built them to run their courses in the heavens. And, and he tells us what the purpose will be. Primarily that they're going to serve as signs and as seasons. So let's first talk about the amazing design of God's universe. You know, if any of you have ever been a stargazer, have looked through a telescope, or you're just fascinated with space, and some people really just love to sit out and, uh, on, a, on a clear, dark night and just look at the Milky Way, you see the stars, you, maybe you're going camping with your family, you just get a chance to, to behold the beauty of creation, and then when you can see closer images from like the Hubble telescope, and man, the colors that are in these supernovas, and and all of these nebulas that are going on. And I mean, I know it, it, some of you may not um, you know, know all about this kind of uh, 
com- cosmic language and things like that, but there's this immense beauty and vastness of power when you look at the, the, the universe. And here's something you need to know about the universe is, is we've, we've figured this out, and the Bible told us about this years ago, is that the Bible says that God is stretching out the heavens. He stretched out the heavens. You know what the, we, know, we know about the known physical universe? It is ever what? Expanding. It blows your mind. It means it's getting bigger, right? It's like a balloon, just expanding. And here's what will blow your mind even more. The universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. We would think there's nothing faster than the speed of light. Oh, yes, yeah, space is expanding faster than the speed of light. So you start thinking about these things. There's the beauty and the complexity and the mathematical precision and the design within the universe, especially in the heavens above. Listen to what David said. David spent a lot of time out as a shepherd. He had plenty of times to sit sit and look at the stars. He had a great view every single night as he would watch over his sheep. Listen to what David said in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the skies above proclaim the work of his hands. So when we see the vastness of the universe, the beauty of the stars, the sun, moon, and the stars, when you see a beautiful sunset or a sunrise or you see a full moon or, or the beautiful stars in the skies, that is an indication. It's, a, it's an imprint. It's evidence of God's divine power and his glory as the creator. Now here's what's interesting is that God designed the sun and the moon and the stars with purpose and precision. Now, this is what will make make, uh, this eclipse tomorrow interesting. Did you know that the sun is 400 times larger than the moon? So when you think about that, there's a drastic difference in the size between the sun and the moon. We understand that. So how is it that when the, the earth and the moon and the sun all are in perfect alignment, which is what's going to happen tomorrow, and that moon comes in between the earth and the sun, how is it that a little bitty tiny moon that's one four hundredth the size of the sun can blot out the entire sun? Well, it's because the sun just so happens to be 400 times farther away from the moon. Now, Now, let's stop and think about that for a second. Is that a mistake? Is that an accident? That's not an accident. Nothing, no, no other ratio like that exists anywhere else in our solar, an observable solar system. You know, most of the planets have moons. None of them are at that perfect ratio between uh, the sun and the, and the moon. And yet here we have, from Earth, from our perspective, when you look at the sun and you look at the moon, they look like they're about the same what? The same size. Because the, the sun is so far away, the exact number of times away, that it is bigger than the moon, which causes this eclipse to be perfectly harmonious. This is really amazing. So this alignment must be exact for us to even be able to observe something like a solar eclipse. Now what you need to know about solar eclipses is that there's a solar eclipse that takes place somewhere on the earth about every 12 to 18 months. Somewhere. So they're not that uncommon okay, when it comes to earth in general. So they, they, they happen quite often, somewhere, somewhere between eight, 12 and 18 months. But when it comes to how often it will, will a particular area, let's just say for Memphis, Tennessee, so we're going to, and I know we're not in the path of totality, okay, but let's just assume, let's say Jonesboro, Arkansas. If you're in Little Rock, Jonesboro, you'll be, you'll be in the path of totality. For that city, Jonesboro, Little Rock, this will be, so rare that the next time a solar eclipse would be expected on average to come back through that area again is about 330 years. So when it comes to us being able to see a total solar eclipse, that's very rare. That doesn't happen but once in every two or three hundred years. You understand what I'm saying? So it, eclipses are common when it comes to the overall, you know, um, planet, but when it comes to particular places on the map, it can become very rare. In other words, the chances of you seeing a full solar eclipse in your lifetime is very, very small, okay? And yet here we are since 2017, the one in August, and now the one tomorrow, and we're going to have what? Two total solar eclipses that pass through the intercontinental United 
States. So this is a little bit rare. I will say that. And so we're about to witness our second total eclipse within seven years right here in the United States. Now, if you've seen a map, any of you guys seen the maps of the path of the eclipse from 17 and the path of the eclipse that's coming through tomorrow, it forms a great big wood across the middle of the country, a big X. Their paths intersect, okay? Now, there's a lot of people out there that have their opinions about what does this mean? I've heard um, lots of prophecy teachers saying, hey, this is God marking the United States for judgment. Could that be the case? There's plenty of reasons why he could be angry and disappointed and ready to judge our nation. I can see that. There's another thing, there's another interesting um, aspect where the, where the total eclipses cross, where the paths cross, it is right over the New Madrid Fault. Southern Illinois, Boot Hill of Missouri, right around in there. So the paths of these two eclipses will actually meet and intersect right over the New Madrid Fault. If you don't know anything about the New Madrid Fault, it is responsible for um, two of the most powerful earthquakes in U.S. history in 1811 in December and then and then the next month in January of 1812, uh, there were earthquakes that were triggered by the, by the breaking of the New Madrid Fault that, that were, uh, I think, over nine on the Richter scale. So devastating that it caused the Mississippi River to flow backwards three days. Created Grillfoot Lake, all of that stuff. Now, does that mean anything? I don't know. It's interesting. So... What I'm, what I'm trying to get to here, guys, as I share these kind of things is it, with you is I don't think we can jump to any conclusions, but we need to take a wait and see mentality. And I'll tell you why I think there's some very good practical application for you and me a little bit later as we look at this in a more detailed, um, in a more detailed way. But as we go, just kind of think about these things because, again, they're interesting. Also, tomorrow evening marks the beginning of the month of Nisan on the Hebrew calendar, which is the first day of the first month of the year, which you would count 14 days from the, from the first of Nisan, and that leads us to Passover. So it's beginning a new year on the Hebrew calendar. That's interesting. Some of the cities that the path of totality are going through are cities called like Jonah and Nineveh and you know, I've heard all kind of theories about all these different cities that the, that the path of totality is, is going to um, move through and move over. I don't know if there's a whole lot to that, but it, again, it's just one of those things. There's also something happening the same time uh, during this solar eclipse is there's another celestial thing going on right now. There's something else called the Devil's Comet. Anybody familiar with this? So there's, there's, there's something called the Devil's Comet. It makes an orbit around... Uh, our solar system, every 71 years, it will be most visible tomorrow during the solar eclipse. It's called the Devil's Comet. It literally has two horns that are sticking off the end of it. That's why they nickname it the Devil's Comet. Now, again, does that mean anything? I don't know. I'm just telling you the facts, right? I'm just, I'm just giving you the information. Interesting stuff, right? Also, you can read that NASA is firing three uh, sound rockets into the shadow of the eclipse. What are they trying to do with that? I don't have any idea. Why are they doing that? I don't know. But they're doing it. Also, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, which y'all know, if any of y'all know what's going on at CERN, it's over in Switzerland and France. They built this massive, like, 200-mile uh, basically tunnel and, we're, and they're, they're crashing atoms into each other, smashing particles together. They're trying, to, they're trying to break matter down into the simplest, most complex, uh, you know, just the most simple uh, elements of life. For some reason, they're starting their hydron collider back up tomorrow in conjunction. With, and they say that they are doing this in conjunction with the eclipse because they want to test and see if it has any effect on this particle accelerator where they're crashing atoms into each other. 
If you don't know much about CERN, that'll send you down a big rabbit hole. Just go, go look it up, C-E-R-N. It's a large, large hadron collider over in Switzerland. I'll give you a couple more. Uh, the next visible eclipse in the, United, in the continental United States will be 2044. It'll only be a partial part of the country that'll be able to see that. But at the end of the day, again, I'm, I'm sharing all of these things with you just simply to say, listen, there's a lot of stuff out there. If you're flipping through your YouTube and you're looking at your reels and everybody gets on there and they start telling you about all this stuff, oh man, tomorrow, this is the day. All this is going to happen. They're predicting all this stuff. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there. Guys, take everything with a grain of salt and filter everything through the word of God. And I would say take a posture of wait and see, okay? Just wait and see. If somebody's out there making predictions, okay, what does the Bible say about people who prophesy? If they prophesy and it comes to pass, you are to trust and believe that that person is speaking on behalf of God. If they prophesy and the thing that they say does not come to pass, uh, according to the Torah, they were supposed to be stoned to death. But again, we're not doing that, obviously. We don't, you know, Jesus died in order to uh, eliminate the death penalty in, in, the, in, that, in that sense, but they are not to be trusted. They're to be, de they're to be declared a false what? A false prophet. Don't listen to that person anymore. Okay, so just be careful about all of this. But let's, let's talk about why did God create the sun, the moon, and the stars? Well, if you, if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis chapter 1, listen to what the Lord says. I'll read it for you right here in Genesis 1.14. He says, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons. Now that word seasons, I've, I've shared with you before, it's the word moedim. And that's a very critical word in scripture. Moedim means God's divine appointments, his appointed feasts. So the appointed feast of the Lord, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, trumpets, day of atonement, tabernacles. Okay, these all were in connection to the uh, the observation of the what? The sun, moon, and the stars, okay? And so you, you were to track the moon and, and, and the way that the, the months, um, you know, transpired throughout the year, and that's how you were to determine what days God has set aside for these, these seasons or these moedim, okay? So they are, they, these, these celestial bodies are put in the heavens for God, by God to be signs, seasons, and for days and for years, so beyond just showing us beauty and power that the heavens do, we worship God, we glorify God because of His power and His beauty. Beyond giving us the life-giving light to facilitate organic life, y'all realize that it's very rare for a planet like ours to even be able to facilitate life. All the components have to be perfectly in place for us to have organic life, to have, to have water and soil and air, oxygen, and the sunlight. And all of those things have to come together perfectly just so that we have life. Is it an accident that we're here and we have life on this planet? It's not an accident. That is by God's design. Look at Mars. It's void of life because it doesn't have the precise um, components necessary for life. And so these are part of what God's purpose is. It's a, it's a natural clock in the sky. You know, you, you wake up with the sun. You typically go to bed as the sun sets, it's kind of this rhythm that God sets. So he's given us these days and these years and these signs and these seasons. But I want to say for today's message, I want to really hone into this idea that God has placed the sun, moon, and the stars in the heavens to serve as signs. To serve as signs. So let's, let's take a little, a little survey of the scripture. Okay. In Joshua's day, Joshua and the children of Israel go up to defend the Gibeonites against the five giant kings of the Amorites. And man, they're pursuing them. They go at night and the battle takes place and God starts to rain down these massive hailstones to kill all of the Amorites. But they couldn't kill them all in, the, in, in one day. It's starting to get what? Starting to get dark. And what does Joshua say? He prays. He says, sun, stand 
still. Sun stands still. And for some reason, the Bible says this, never again has God heeded the voice of a man like he did with Joshua on that day. Something amazing, supernatural happened that day where God extended the day for about another 24-hour period. Now, how did he do that? I don't know. No idea how that happened. But it happened, okay? So there's a sign, and God used it in this amazing story with Joshua and judgment. Y'all remember King Hezekiah? He gets sick. He's dying. He, he weeps. He prays. He asks God to have mercy on him. God says, listen, I'll let you live another 15 years. And what does Hezekiah say? Lord, show me a what? A sign. And the Lord's like, okay, listen to what he says. He says, this shall be the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing he has promised. Behold, I will make the shadow cast by the declining sun on the dial of Ahaz to turn back ten steps. And so the sun turned back on the dial ten steps by which it had declined. So you have sundials, and as the sundial casts the shadow on these steps right outside of the palace, Hezekiah's palace, that gives you an indication of what time of day it is, right? The longer the shadows get, the later in the day it gets. Y'all understand how that works. Well, what did God do? He turned back time. He said, I'm going to turn it back ten steps as a sign for you, Hezekiah. How did God do that? I have no idea. Was it a natural phenomenon or was it something supernatural? I think it was probably something supernatural. Think about what happened with the Magi in the east and the birth of the, of the Messiah, right? What did they see? They saw a star in the heavens. They're observing. And something told them that the Messiah, the Son of God, had been born. What was that? Maybe it was a conjunction. Um, we don't really know. Again, there's some, there's some mystery surrounding this star. Because it seems like this star kind of leads them and settles over the, the cave or the place where the Messiah was or the house where the Messiah was, or whatever it may be, and you're like, what kind of star is this? I, I don't know. But again, they're observing the stars, and it was connected as a what? A sign. It told these magi that something amazing was happening, and God was doing something. Now, think about some of the other things that's happened in Scripture. When Moses um, led the children of Israel out of Egypt, God cast the, the, um, the nation of Egypt in total darkness for how long does anybody know three whole days that's not a solar eclipse we might get four minutes of darkness if you're in the path of totality not three days so i don't think we can say that was a solar eclipse do you remember when jesus was crucified what happened there was total what darkness for three hours i don't think that was a totally i don't think that was a solar eclipse Again, it doesn't make sense when a solar eclipse and the way things are moving, it only lasts several minutes. But when Jesus was crucified, it said from the sixth hour to about the ninth hour, there was total darkness in the land. So you see that these are all signs in the heavens that God uses to get our attention, to send us a message or whatever it may be, and we're going to get to that in just a second. So here's what I want to tell you about solar eclipses. This is what's interesting, is I went back through the scripture and started studying. The natural phenomenon of lunar and solar eclipses are not explicitly mentioned in scripture. Do you know that? Interesting. Unless you could take like a passage that I read today from Luke 21, and there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars. Well, that's a general sense. Maybe that does include eclipses. Maybe. But when we go back and look at the things that God did historically with Joshua and Moses and Jesus and the star of Bethlehem and all those kind of things, these are not, in my opinion, necessarily natural phenomena. These are, these are more supernatural things that God is doing. There could have been a natural component to it, but in my estimation, this is a little bit something more. So again, we don't want to jump to conclusions and don't buy into all the sensational reports that you're hearing out there. So what do we do with these signs? Well, my second point for you today is this. This is where it starts to get very, very practical. See, God uses signs. And let's just say tomorrow, let's, let's, just, let's just assume tomorrow's eclipse is a sign. Okay? What's God's purpose in it? He wants to get our what? Attention. And he wants to send us a message. What is a sign? A sign is a visible symbol... Or a message that is designed to capture our attention 
and give us some direction, right? When you're driving out on the highway, you look at signs. Sometimes it's an advertisement on the billboard, like the one that says, caught you looking. You ever, you ever get caught looking at that one? You know, they're good at what they do. These advertisers, now they get our attention. Or you're trying to, to get off at this exit and you're looking at the signs and you're, and you're trying to figure out where to go. And these signs, they give us direction. They send us a message. Sometimes they can provide us a warning, right? Like do not touch or steer clear of the cliff or stand back 200 feet or whatever it may be. But these signs are there and they can be life-saving. Sometimes signs can be very much life-saving and you know what? Signs can also change the course of our lives as we take a particular path by following a sign. And so God historically has always used these things to get our attention, not just his people's attention, but listen to me, guys. And this is where I want you to really perk up. See, God is also getting the attention of everyone else because everybody else is, hum is humming and buzzing about this eclipse. People who are not followers of Christ. People who are not believers. But they're like, man, this is kind of interesting, right? Man, what's this all about? Like, man, this is a, this is a major deal. And, and they're at least beginning to get interested with things that are happening in the, heavenly, um, in the heavenly places. And that gives us a tremendous opportunity, guys, to share and witness to these people. So what does a sign ultimately do? A sign will validate God's word a sign is always used to validate God's word God perform, performed signs through Moses and Aaron to validate their word to Pharaoh he performed signs through Joshua and Elijah and Isaiah and Daniel and of course he performed signs through the Messiah Jesus Christ himself remember when John the Baptist was in prison and he is facing ex execution do y'all remember what he said John sent his disciples to Jesus and he said, ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we look for someone else? Remember what John said? And it says that this very hour, Jesus was healing many people of diseases and affliction and evil spirits. And he gave sight to many who were blind. And so listen to what Jesus told John's disciples. Now he could have just said, now you're asking, am I the one, am I the Messiah? He could have just said what? Yeah, I am. But listen to how Jesus answered. Go and tell John what you have seen and what you have heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. You see, Jesus came preaching the, good, the gospel of the kingdom and his miracles and his signs were validation that his message was true. Miracles always validate the message. He walked on water. He multiplied the loaves and the fish. He turned water into wine. Even Nicodemus, when he came to Jesus, what did he say? Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. So guys, maybe, just, just maybe in a general sense, tomorrow's eclipse is a sign... And it's a sign that God is using to try to get your and my attention. And maybe he is trying to send us a message. Maybe, maybe that message is for the United States of America. Maybe that message is for the church in the United States of America. I don't know. Time will tell. And so it should wake us up, get our attention, break our routine, shift our focus, and prepare us to receive the message that he has for us. And so Jesus is telling us in, in, in advance that there would be signs and wonders that would precede his second coming and we would, do be, we would do well to pay attention and prepare and watch and wait, preparing ourselves for the troubling days ahead. And I think there's one major component in all of this that God typically uses these signs he, he uses these signs to call his people, to call his people to repentance. Let me say that again. If it's here to get our attention, if it's here to send us a message, I believe with all of my heart, part of that message is God is telling his people, he's telling you and me, it's time to get right. It's time to get right with me. 
It's time to repent. It's time to stop playing around. It's time to stop living with your one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It's time for you to get serious about your faith because the Bible says that judgment begins with the household of God. Y'all know that, right? Judgment does not begin with the heathen and the people out there living their lives in the world and living in sin and all that. Judgment doesn't begin with them. We think, that, oh, man, look at all those terrible people out there, man. God's got it in for them. No, no, no. The Bible says that judgment begins where? Right here. There's things that God's not very happy about here. Here. In the heart. In the house of God. And so I have two more things that I want to share with you guys and as we kind of move toward this practical application today is that as we watch, okay, and I bet most of you are going to be watching tomorrow, some form or fashion, wear, make sure to wear your glasses. Don't stare into the sun, right? As you watch, you should not be surprised or afraid of the troubling days ahead. Now, guys, I know there's been trouble on the earth ever since the beginning, right? Absolutely. But Jesus has told us that there will be a specific time of trouble that the world has never seen before, that's never been experienced since the beginning of time, nor never will be experienced again. And in the context of this passage, he's trying to get our attention. He's trying to wake us up. And he's saying, listen, when these things begin to happen, look at what he says. He says, there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth, dismay among the nations. People will be bewildered. They're going to be confused and perplexed by the roaring of the sea and the surging of the waves and men will faint from fear and anxiety over what is coming upon the earth. Guys, listen to me. If and when these things begin to take place, there will, there will be an increasing intensity and frequency of chaos and catastrophe there's going to be war we know we, we understand what are the signs of of the end times and those kind of things but we have to understand that these things are going to begin to roll like a snowball going downhill and once it gets going nothing can what nothing's going to be able to stop it it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and faster and faster and faster and guess what the world is going to be sitting back looking at this stuff all of these things are going to be happening on so many different levels and in so many different ways and they're going to be terrified fainting with fear completely confused and perplexed and just their whole world's going to be spinning out of control but for god's people Jesus tells us these things ahead of time so that we will not be surprised. Don't be surprised. And don't be what? Afraid. Don't be afraid. Okay? So we need to determine in our hearts right now whether or not, you know, whether or not tomorrow has anything to do with the, with the, with the last days, the, the very end of this age. Okay? I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying it's an opportunity for us to evaluate ourselves and make sure we check our faith because here's what God's calling you and me. He's calling us to exercise faith over fear. Faith over fear. That should be the, the, the clarion call of the believer that, that we have all of these reasons to fear, whether it be day-to-day -day sickness, health, finances, relationship struggles, or whether it be things going on in the world with potential war and economies bad, and all of these things, guys, God is always calling us to exercise what? Faith. Faith over the fear. And we need, to, we need to determine that right now, that we're not going to be afraid, we're not going to be dismayed, and we're not going to be surprised. Because the Bible says that God's perfect love will do what? Cast out all fear from our hearts. So as we take this opportunity to get our relationships right with the Lord and draw near to the Lord, we say, Lord, just flood my heart. Fill my soul with your love. Give me that perfect love. Help me to remember that you love me no matter what. That nothing in all creation will be able to separate me from your love. Not death. Not famine, not tribulation, not persecution. Nothing will separate me. And so God's love cast out all of that fear. And once again, as I want to share this briefly with you earlier, remember this, guys, is that people are watching. 
the world is waiting, the world is looking, the world has questions, the world is confused, the world is scared. They're going to be increasingly more confused and more scared in these things. If these things continue to proceed with intensity and frequency, they're going to be like, what's going on? The world that I thought was you know, my normal life, it's, it's, it's gone. It's over. Same thing that kind of happened in 2020, right? Everybody's life was just completely stopped. The craziest thing I've ever seen, right? And the world was like, what is happening? What's going on? Guys, what is that as a believer? That is an opportunity for you and for me to be his witnesses. People are going to be desperate for answers. We have the answers. We have the gospel. We have hope and peace that only Jesus can provide for the people in this world who are living in fear and in chaos. And so I want you not to be surprised. I want you not to be afraid. We need to be prepared right now that God, if I'm here and living in these exciting times, then you want to use me for a reason and for a purpose. And that purpose, guys, is to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and let people know, hey, you don't have to be afraid. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He can give you peace and joy and eternal life. And no matter what happens, no matter if the whole world caves in, we're okay because we belong to God. And my soul is secure in Him, right? That's the, that's the message of the gospel. And so my last point is this, guys. So what are we going to do with this? All right, you ready? We need to stand up, lift up our heads, and fix our eyes upon Jesus. Because I can say this with all confidence. Our redemption is closer today than it's what? Ever been before. That's a fact. Our redemption, the return of Christ, is closer today than it ever has been before. So we need to stand up, lift up our heads, and fix our eyes upon Jesus. And so this is where God took me with this message. Take it for what, what it's worth. Take it for what, it, what, what, it's, what you will. Okay. If anything that our generation is defined by, I'm going to say, you know, I graduated, I was born in 78. I graduated high school from 1997. And so I'm still like a, um, what am I, Generation X? Is that what that is? Is that a Generation Xer? They're the coolest, by the way. We got to live life before the internet, before social media. Thank God that my life wasn't posted all over social media. You don't know anything that I did when I was 17, 15, 16 years old, right? Thank goodness. I feel for these kids. Kids, by the way, once you post it, it's always there. It's always there. You, you, may, you may think you deleted it. It's there. But what defines this generation, guys? This defines. I've fallen into it as well. So how many times you go out in public and people are walking up and down the street like this and they're sitting at the dinner table in, in the restaurants and they're... We see that a lot. Everybody's glued. Everybody's just, just sucked in. We keep our heads what? Down. And we keep our eyes locked on these devices which are so addictive. So addictive. And what do these devices really do? Now, can this thing be used for good? Absolutely. That's, that's the double-edged sword of technology, man. There's a lot of good out there. I can watch a YouTube video of a guy helping somebody on the street and just break down in tears and cry and be like, man, that's awesome. And I can spend 30 minutes wasting my time scrolling through a bunch of just stupid junk. It's just goofy stuff, you know. It doesn't make any, you know, it's, for, for, it's just waste of my time, right? So it's a double-edged sword, and I get that, but mainly what do these things do? They keep us distracted, they make us unproductive. You know how much time we waste? I'm talking to myself. If you don't know, you can, you can set it up where you, you monitor how much time you spend on social media. You look up and you're like, man, I spent three hours today scrolling through Facebook. What in the world? You know what you can do in three hours? You can be more productive. 
So we can be unproductive, we're distracted, and we're consumed. And here's the problem. It's a fantasy. This is not real life. And it's a deception and it's a false reality. And that's what breaks my heart so much is when you see families sitting together at the dinner table and you're there in the presence of your loved ones. Guess what, guys? That's reality. That's reality. This is not reality. And yet they're plugged in here and they're not engaging with right there what's in front of them. And so these phones can be the devil's playground. Again, can they be used for good? Sure. But let's just be honest. Most of the time, are they really leading us closer to God or further away? Let's just be honest. So here's my, here's my application for you guys. Maybe this time during the solar eclipse is an opportunity, remember, to get our attention. Maybe God's sending us a message. We shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't be worried. We shouldn't be surprised. We should be looking for opportunities to share our faith. But maybe for you, I can't tell you what you need to do with it. I'll tell you what God's convicting me to do, it, uh, to do with this. Is that it's time for me to wean myself. To wean myself off of this. Now, does that mean I'll never use it? Uh, no, I can tell you. I'm, you know, and that's how we justify it too. I just want, as a pastor, you know, like I have to have a phone. You know, I got to check my email and I'm getting text messages and I got to check the website and I got to do, you know, we use it for worship and all this kind of stuff. I got to have a phone. So here's what I'm going to say. How do you, you, how do you do this responsibly? Okay, let me, let me give you a couple of pointers. I think that we can start this way. Take at least one part of your day, let's say an hour. Let's just start with an hour. Okay, I'm just going to put a challenge out there to you and for me. Let's just say for one hour every single day, you turn it what? Turn the phone off. Don't, don't just put it somewhere else because you're going to hear it what? You're going to hear it being. And you're going to, because you're addicted like me, you're going to go pick it up. Turn it off, put it in a drawer, and go do something else. Go outside and lay on the ground and just look at the, look at the sky. Go outside at night on a beautiful moonlit night on a starry night and just go out there with your family and, and look at the stars and tell stories. Sing music, play guitar, cook a meal, do some work projects, plant a garden. I don't care what you do, just do something else. Because guys, I really think with all of my heart that, that we're not hearing with God, we're not connecting with God, that we're missing so much that God is trying to do and tell and show us and, the, and the, the, the things that he's trying to get through to us and that we're not able to really get those things because we're so distracted and we're so caught up with this fantasy world. And, in, and the last time that, that you went outside and just looked up at the sky, let me ask you, when is the last time you did that? When is the last time you just went outside on a beautiful day with no phone, no agenda, you just sat there and you just looked up at the sky. We used to do that, you know, when I was a kid growing up, that's, that's pretty much all what we had time to do. Like, that's the only thing we had to do, right? And, and we'd play games and like, make little shapes in the clouds, you know. Like, look at that, there's a, there's a well and there's a, a unicorn or whatever. I mean, and that was how we passed the time. The kids don't know anything about that anymore. And adults, we don't either. And so I'm just challenging you today that... We need to get this disengagement, this distraction, this delusion. We need to get this out of our system and start taking steps to wean ourselves or free ourselves from the destructive influence of technology. If technology is part of your life and your job, I get it. I understand you, you you're going to have to use it, which means that all the more, if you're in that position, then you need to dedicate a certain amount of time each and every day. Start small, whatever that may be, but... You need to dedicate a certain amount of time each and every day where you cut it off, you disconnect, you quit looking down, and you start looking up. Guys, we need to lift up our heads. We need to, we need to glorify God at the beauty of His creation. We need, to, we need to get our hearts and our minds fixed where? In the heavens above. Isn't that what the Scripture tells us? That, that we are to fix our eyes on things above and not below? So we need to stand up. We need to lift up our heads. Because let me tell you something, guys. Many of us are beat down and we're discouraged and we're dejected and we're living in despair and we're being robbed of our joy and our hope and our peace. And so you know what the Bible says? It says, lift up your heads. Set your heart where? In the heavens above. Because who's seated at the right hand of the Father right now? Jesus. Jesus. 
Who has all authority in heaven and earth? Jesus. Who's the one that intercedes for us when we're, when we're struggling? It's Jesus. That's what we're looking for. We're looking to him. We're fixing our eyes on him. Yeah, in a visual way. Yes, put your eyes on the clouds. Put your eyes on the stars. Put your eyes on the sun and the moon and all of the things that God created for a purpose because that's getting our hearts back on Jesus and we're getting our heads out of the discouragement and the despair and the distraction that comes with us keeping our heads down, defeated, dejected. We fix our eyes on Jesus. So I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask Dion to come up. We're going we're to sing one more song. And so that's, that's, your, that's your application, guys. Take that, do with it whatever it is that you need to do. Everybody knows what they need to change. But the Bible says that we're to stand up, Lift up your head and fix your eyes on who? On Jesus. Because our redemption draws near. Guys, it's, it's, it's near. It's nearer than it's ever been before. You know what that means? There's a sense of urgency that we have more and more reason now than ever before, whether this is your last day on earth or whether Jesus comes in, in the near future, whatever that may be, we have a limited amount of time, a window, to do the work that God put us on this earth to do. And that's what I encourage all of you to do. So would you bow your heads with me as we pray and we're going we're gonna to sing one more song. Heavenly Father, I do, I do thank you that you've placed the beauty of creation before us so that we can give glory to you and witness your hand at work around us, Lord, and thank you for sending your Son, Lord, into this earth to reveal yourself to us personally. And Lord, you've told us that you're coming back. And Lord, we know that until you come, Lord, and until we go to be with you, Lord, we have a unique opportunity to be your witnesses, not to be surprised, not to be afraid, but Lord, if you're sending us a message, if you're trying to get our attention, Lord, help us to take action. Help us to get our eyes lifted up, fixed upon you, Lord. Help us to remove the distractions that this world is, is laying out before us that's got us sucked in to this technology and the, the temptation and, and the discouragement, Lord, and all the distractions that come with it, Lord. Help us to take action so that we would draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we continue to worship.
bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us. We just ask for your favor, O oh God, and you would give us peace. Lord, not, not to be afraid, but that we would have peace as we go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, amen. God bless, guys. Y'all have a wonderful day.